Last class period, we dealt basically with all of 8.1 that we were going to do, but I'll just remind you of kind of what's going on. So it's, that sequence is what we were talking about. It is a function whose domain is positive integers or counting numbers. And so the first term we're going to call A1, the second term, third term. And so we think of it as this sort of list of numbers. Okay. So we think of it as this list of numbers and we can define it using a closed function, f of n is equal to the nth term in the sequence. Or we can define it recursively, all right? And we did that a few times and did the, vice, the opposite. And then we said a limit of a sequence is simply the limit as n goes to infinity, all right? Limit of that closed function as n goes to infinity. So if you have a closed function, that's what it is, all right? We looked at a couple of theorems, and then we ended doing this one, and we saw that the first two were both bounded and monotonic, so they had limits, and we actually could find the limits using techniques that we've seen earlier. And then that third one was bounded, but not monotonic. Uh, but it still had a limit. So not all sequences with limits have to be bounded and monotonic, but all bounded monotonic sequences have to have a limit. That makes sense. All right. <coughs> Now, I do want to do at least the first couple of these just to find some limits of these sequences. So if the nth term in a sequence is 2 thirds to the nth power, we'll find the limit of that. And then let's look at negative two-thirds to the nth power. And then might as well, we'll do all three. a sub n equals five n e to the negative n, okay? So let's find the limits of these sequences. We don't have to, we in fact won't use bounded monotonic stuff. That's not what we'll do. But on that second one, we will use the absolute value. We'll see that in just a moment. Okay. Does that work? So I want to go over these in particular because these are a type of sequence, these first two anyways, that uh, is going to come up in the next, next part in 9.2. So if we want to take the limit as n goes to infinity of our sequence, we're taking the limit of 2 thirds to the nth power. You can either numerically deal with this limit where you just plug in higher and higher values of n. Another way to deal with this is to look at the limit graphically. We have an exponential function y equals two-thirds to the x power. And if we graph that, you would see you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero for the x-axis. So I'll just use that, okay? So since y equals two thirds to the x power, 
is going towards the x-axis. Well, if we restrict the domain just to positive integers, then it's still going towards the x-axis. It'll start here, go towards the x-axis. So this limit is equal to zero. Now, if you look at this one, negative two thirds to the nth power. Well, if I crossed out the negative sign, it would be exactly like this. And because n has to be positive integers, what's going to happen is that that sequence is going to alternate between uh, let me write it this way. Let me write, draw the other one. If I did negative two thirds to the x power, you can't do negative two thirds to the x power where the negative's on the inside because you can't have a negative base, right? In an exponential function, if you're allowing your domain to be all real numbers. So if you want your domain to be all real numbers, can't have a negative base. So this one doesn't, doesn't work if our domain's all real numbers. But if we throw the negative on the outside, then what happens is we get that, right? And what this sequence is going to do is it's going to bounce back and forth. When A is 1, when I said A, excuse me, when N is one, my A sub one term is going to be negative. So it's going to be on the bottom. When N is two, my A sub two term is going to be positive. So what's happening is this is bouncing back and forth between those two graphs, the terms in the sequence. And this is exactly, this is precisely the absolute value theorem. Okay. If I take the absolute value of negative two thirds to the nth power, that's the same thing as just two thirds to the nth power. The negative is going to be canceled out. All right. We know. from our work above that the limit as n goes to infinity of two thirds to the nth power is zero. So by the absolute value theorem, the limit of negative two thirds to the nth power also has to be zero as n goes to infinity. All right. That's the absolute value theorem. On this third one, this is again similar to something we've dealt with earlier. Now, I have 5n e to the negative nth power. And sometimes, well, if you're comfortable with negative exponents, that's perfectly fine. But sometimes people would rather write things with positive exponents because that makes a little bit more sense to them. So I'm going to rewrite that as 5n divided by e to the positive n power. Hopefully we all know that negative exponent, we can put the denominator and turn the exponent positive. What's this going to, what's this limit going to be? Anybody know already? Zero. Zero. Yeah. The bottom is an exponential function. 
So if you continually take derivatives, you'll still get an exponential function. The bottom, the top is a polynomial. So if you take a derivative, it'll go away eventually. Okay, in this case, it'll go on the way of the first derivative. So we saw that earlier, not this exact one, but we saw it with two to the n compared with n squared. Right now, I'm just gonna write polynomial divided by exponential. All right, so the bottom grows faster when n gets really, really big. So any questions about finding limits of sequences? Good. Well, again, most of the reason that I did that is just to remind you of kind of what we were doing last time and how we ended last time, finding limits of sequences. And each of these three sequences that we just dealt with had limit being zero. It turns out that that's kind of special for the next thing that we're gonna do. Because the next thing we're gonna do is deal with series and the convergence of series. So a sequence we think of as being an infinite list of numbers, right? We think of it that way. It's a function whose domain is positive integers, but we think of it as this infinite list of numbers. A series takes that infinite list of numbers and adds them all up. I should say, let me rephrase that. Technically, you can have a finite series where we're just adding up a finite number of values. Those aren't very interesting. Okay, you just add up a bunch of numbers. I mean, obviously, there's some interesting relationships that you can see, but... Um, but... The weird thing is when we have an infinite series. So in this class, when we talk about series, we're going to be talking about infinite series. Okay. And think of it as an infinite summation. We're adding up a sequence, basically. So a series is the sum of a sequence. Notationally, uh, we've probably seen this giant sigma. That just means add up, add everything up. So it just means add up all of the terms. The terms start with A1, and then they go to A2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up, infinitely many things. Now, the weird thing about this is that we're adding up an infinite amount of numbers. So we're adding up an infinite amount of numbers. And sometimes when we add up an infinite amount of things, our sum becomes infinity. But other times when we add up an infinite amount of things, our sum becomes finite. And that's the really crazy thing. That's a... Uh, a very interesting thing. When we add up an infinite amount of numbers and it adds up to a finite number, it almost doesn't seem right. Now, the first approach that we're going to take to try to find this infinite sum, this infinite series, 
Well, let me take one step back. The goal of infinite series is going to be determining when an infinite series sums up to a finite number. And in some cases, finding out what that number actually is. We won't always be able to figure out what the number is, but in some cases, we'll look and see what the number is. So the big goal is when does that infinite sum add up to a finite number? And so our first approach at trying to find the infinite sum is going to be using partial sums. A partial sum is just a pattern of sums. So we usually denote the partial sums with S's. S1 is just the first term by itself. S2 is the sum of the first two terms. S3 is the sum of the first three terms. S4 would be the sum of the first four terms. S5 would be the sum of the first five terms. Sn in general is the sum of the first n terms. And so if we list out the partial sums, Sometimes we can see a pattern and say, well, if the partial sums emit this pattern that's closing in on its number, then the series is going to add up to that number, the infinite series. So let's say we have an infinite series. If the limit of the partial sums is equal to S, then the infinite series, we say, sums up to S. Does that make sense? So this is what I was saying, but just in word format. If we see this pattern with the SNs, and by pattern, I mean the limit of the SNs are going towards a certain number. Then we say the infinite series converges to that number. Now, if we look at the limit of the partial sums and the limit of the partial sums is infinity or does not exist, another way to say that is the partial sums diverge. So if the partial sums diverge, then we say the series also diverges. So if the partial sums have a limit, then we say the series sums up to that limit. If the partial sums diverge, we say the series diverges. So that's our first approach. Let's see how this would work through an example. Okay. So let's use partial sums to try to calculate this infinite series. The infinite series of adding up one over 2 to the nth power. 
Now, what I like to do is I like to write out the first, the first few terms of the inner sequence so that I know what I'm adding my partial sums. Does that make sense? So this infinite sum, when n is 1, I get 1 half. When n is 2, I get 1 fourth. When n is 3, I get an 8. So I write out the first few additions in the infinite series. Okay. Now, S1 is just the first term itself. So that's just one half. S2 is the sum of the first two terms. So that's a half plus a fourth. And I'm going to leave this in fraction form. You'll see why in just a moment. S3 is a half plus a fourth plus an eighth. By the way, when you do this summation, a half plus a fourth plus an eighth, you can just add an eighth to this. And you end up with seven eighths. It turns out that when you add a sixteenth to this, you get fifteen over sixteen. I won't write out all the terms, but. And then when you add a thirty second to this one, I'm just adding one more term, you get 31 over 32. And you can do this all with your calculator, just adding, you know, just add the next term and then convert to a fraction. Add the next term, convert to a fraction. I'm just taking that out. If I take 31 over 32 and I add a 64th, I get 63 over 64. What's the pattern that we see here? Well, the denominator is always the next power of two. So the pattern for my partial sums is that the denominator is 2 to whatever n power. So 32 is 2 to the 5th, 16 is 2 to the 4th, 8 is 2 to the 3rd. We okay, got that. So it's 2 to a power. And then the numerator is always 1 less than the denominator. So the denominator minus 1. So that's the pattern. That means the limit of the partial sums is going to be the limit of 2n minus 1 divided by 2n Now you could convince yourself of this, or you could use L'Hopital's rule. If you use L'Hopital's rule, this minus one goes away when you take a derivative, and then the top becomes exactly the same as the bottom. It's two to the n times natural log of two. So you could use L'Hopital's rule directly, or you could just convince yourself numerically, we're always getting 
a little bit closer to one, right? And so the limit of that is one. So we found the patterns in the partial sums. The partial sums have limit one. As you increase in, you get closer and closer and closer to one. Therefore, we say the infinite sum of one over two to the nth power is equal to one or converges to one. So this infinite series converges to one. Does that make sense? So we create a pattern with our partial sums. Our partial sums have limit of a certain number. And so the infinite sum is equal to that number or converges to that number. By the way, this is kind of an interesting one. This is a very well-known infinite uh, series. And it, it's one where you'll often see what's called a proof without words. Okay. There's a geometrical way to see this. Okay. Take a square. which is one unit by one unit. So the area is equal to one square unit. Whatever, if it's inches, if it's feet, it doesn't matter. So area is one square unit. Well, what if I cut it in half? That would be a half of a square unit. So the total area of the square is one, right? Now, that part is a half. Let's take the other part and cut that in, a half, in half. That's a four. Well, let's take the leftover part and cut that in half. That's an eighth. You could, there's multiple ways to draw this, but let's take the other leftover part and cut that in half. That's a 16. Take the leftover part, cut it in half. That's one out of 32. And then you can see you could infinitely cut things in half over and over and over again. And the infinite cutting in half is exactly the same as this infinite sum. But the total area is one, which is that shows that the infinite sum, where we just continually cut things in half, gives me a one. Right. Most, most infinite series are not going to have this sort of intuition. Okay. But this one is a unique one that it has this. So I always want to see that. So that's how partial sums work. So most of them are going to have this nice picture. This one does. But we do want to look at those partial sums. Okay.
Now let's do another one. We're going to take the infinite sum of point four, and notice there's no, it's not being raised to the nth power or not doing anything like that. It's just the infinite sum from n equals one to infinity of point four. And we'll look at partial sums of that. Now again, there's no, this is not 0.4 to the nth power, that's different. It's just 0.4. So if you're infinitely summing 0.4, that means you take 0.4 plus another 0.4 plus another 0.4 plus another 0.4 plus another 0.4 and so on and so forth. So that's the infinite sum of just a constant number of 0.4. So the infinite sum of a constant number. So my S1 is 0.4. My S2 is 0.4 plus 0.4. I'm just going to write the answer there, 0.8. Is that okay? My S3 add another 0. 0.4, 1.2. S4, add another 0. 0.4, 1.6. S5, add another 0. 0.4, 2.0. S6, add another 0. 0.4, 2.4, and so on and so forth. What's the pattern here? Yeah, so my Sn, would be what closed function? N plus 0.4. Yeah, N, uh, 0.4 times N, or N times 0.4. So that's the closed function. The recursive function is just you take the next thing and you add 0.4 to it, right? That's the recursive one. But if we're looking for a closed function pattern, uh, it's 0.4 times N over and over and over. So if you take the limit of 0.4 times n, as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this 0.4 times n just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So this limit is going out to infinity, right? It just keeps getting bigger, 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 bigger every time jumps up a little bit. And so what we say is that this infinite series diverges. Some people would say goes to infinity or diverges to infinity. So you'll all, you might hear me say that language as well. So if I ever say diverges to infinity, that's not real technical, but I will sometimes say that. By the way, this shows something. If we're always adding a number each time, like a constant number each time, you can see that we're going to be forced to go to infinity, right? And that kind of brings up the next rule Whoops. about infinite series. This is our first rule. If the terms of the underlying sequence of the infinite series 
don't go to zero, then we'll just be adding up numbers a bunch of times, right? Let's say the terms of the sequence get closer and closer and closer to 0. 0.4. Well, that's like adding up 0. 0.4 infinitely many times, and we know it's going to go to infinity, right? And even if it jumps back and forth between 0. 0.4 and negative 0. 0.4, it's going to, the series is going to jump, partial sums are going to jump back and forth. So the limit won't exist on the partial sums. <clears throat> so, the idea here is that if you're adding up terms that aren't getting closer to zero, then there's no way you're going to converge. This is known as the divergence rule. If the limit of the terms of the underlying sequence don't go to zero, if the limit's not zero, then the series diverges. And so we could have, in our last problem, said, well, I see that the underlying sequence is just 0.4 every time. The limit of that 0.4 is equal to 0.4, which is not zero, so it's going to diverge. And therefore, we didn't, from now on, if we see that the underlying sequence doesn't have limit, which goes to zero, we're just going to use the divergence theorem. We don't have to come up with all the partial sums. Right? So we can do things a little bit faster. We don't have to find those partial sums every time. Oh, shoot. Okay. Let's take a look at this one. Now, this one, the underlying sequence, as n gets really, really big, both fractions go to zero, right? One over n goes to zero and 1 over n plus 2 goes to 0. So the underlying sequence inside this series does have limit 0. So this may converge. It may not also, but may converge. So we're going to look for partial sums here. And just, I'm going to shut this off in a second, but just so that we know, this thing that I'm dealing with is called a telescoping series. And you'll see why it gets its name in just a moment. Okay. This one I might need a little bit more room for. All right, so let's take these partial sums. The first term is going to be 1 over 1 minus 1 over a third. 1 over 3, excuse me. 1 over 3. 1 third, which is 1 over 3. So 1 over 1 minus 1 over 3. Does everybody understand where I'm getting that? That's the first term. The second term is going to be 1 half minus a fourth. That's what happens when I plug in two. When I plug in three, I get one third minus a fifth. When I plug in four, I get one fourth minus a sixth. When I plug in five, I get one fifth minus a seventh. And when I plug in six, I get one sixth minus an eighth. 
And that pattern goes on and on and on and on. Like I said, I'm gonna sort of overdo these sequences for this, in this case. All right, you're gonna get all the terms. There's a lot of terms in the sequence. So let's take a look at the partial sums. I am going to purposefully leave these on added together. But I am going to rearrange something. I'm going to call this one over one plus a half minus a third minus a fourth. Is that okay? I'm going to rearrange the terms. So the positive ones come first. Okay. Now, once we get down to the third partial sum, something interesting happens. I'll write it out this time, but I won't write it out the next few times. So what happens is we get one minus a third plus a half minus a fourth plus a third minus a fifth. Now I want you to notice this minus one third now can cancel with this plus one third. This is the nature of why this is called a telescoping series. That some of these terms are gonna cancel each other out and we're gonna get a smaller expression. So what do I have now? I have a one plus a half minus a fourth minus a fifth. One plus a half minus a fourth minus a fifth. Now, when you include up to four terms, and I'm, not, I'm just trying to draw that for emphasis, What's going to happen is this one third cancels out with this, this negative one third cancels out with this positive one third. But then also this negative one fourth is going to cancel out with this positive one fourth. See that? And when you take the sum of the first four terms, now I have one plus a half, minus a fifth, minus a sixth. When you increase that to the sum of the first five terms, this positive one fifth cancels out with this negative one fifth. So you have the one plus a half still, and then you just have the n2 negative terms. You can see why it's called telescoping. These middle terms are canceling each other out, right? So S sub five is one, plus a half, minus one-sixth, minus one-seventh. S sub six is going to be one plus a half. Then this one-sixth cancels out with the next negative one-sixth. So it's, you're going to get a negative one-seventh and a negative one-eighth. And so on and so forth. 
And I think that's probably sufficient to give us a path. So what we see is that our pattern for the SN terms, or in other words, the closed function that determines S sub N, is always going to be 1 plus a half minus, now be careful here, this is N plus one, four is one more than three, five is one more than four, that makes sense. And then n plus two is here. Six is two more than four, five is two more than three, seven is two more than five, eight is two more than six. So what we get is one plus a half plus one over, or not, take it, that should be a minus. Minus one over n plus one. Minus one over n plus Put a plus there. I'm very good with that, that concept. So let's take the limit of the partial sums. The limit of a constant number is just the constant number itself. So one's going to stay put. Limit of a constant number, that's going to be stay put. So the one and the one half, just going to be one plus a half. This, as n goes to infinity, this is constant on top. Denominator is getting huge. That's going to go to zero. This is constant on top. Denominator is getting huge. That's going to zero as well. So this limit is equal to basically one and a half. Because those two fractions go to zero, and then we have constants of one and a half that just stay put. So that means this infinite series where we add up one over n minus one over n plus two. Is one and a half or converges to. One and a half. Or 1.5 or three halves, however you want to write that, right? Whether you write the number as a mixed number or a decimal or a partial fraction, not, a, not partial, improper fraction, excuse me. All those are fun. And again, this concept, this is a telescoping series. This is a, known as a telescoping series um, because the middle terms are sort of canceling each other out. All right. And so it's think of a telescope being put drawn out long and then compacted it. Any questions about that? Partial sums. By the way, if you try to do this numerically by taking one minus a third and getting two thirds. And then whatever the heck this would be numerically, it would be really, really hard to tell. Okay, at least for the first few terms. 
it would be easier to tell if you had 100 terms, but for the first few terms, it would be hard to tell. All right. So that's an example of what's known as a telescoping series. Now, this is another type of series that we'll be looking at. And this type of series we'll be looking at a lot. But I want to do one, at least one, with partial sums. So this is 7 times 1 fourth to the nth power. Now I want you to take note, we're gonna start our count at zero rather than one for this one, okay? That's legal to do with an infinite series because you can just start your count moving it over. It's still infinitely many terms, but if you start your count at zero as opposed to one, with exponents, sometimes that's nice. You could have actually started at any value. You could start your count at 12 if you wanted to. And start with n equals 12 to infinity. That's still an infinite series. Okay. The exponential nature, having n in the exponent, kind of makes this a geometric series. And I'll explain what a geometric series is. We'll look at some rules for geometric series in a bit. All right. So when n is 0, 1 fourth to the 0 power is 1. So we get 7 times 1. When n is 1, we get 7 times a fourth. When n is 2, we get 7 times 1 over 4 squared, which is 1 over 16. Then 4 times 16, 64. So the uh, seven times one over sixty four. Uh, that's two fifty six, I believe. Just multiplying by four in the denominator each time, right? Then I get one thousand twenty four in my denominator. And then I get one over 4,096. I don't know how many I'm gonna go out to, but I don't probably do more than plenty. 16, 384. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Notice that all of these have kind of seven out front. So I'm just going to factor the seven out. Does that make sense? When I write my partial sums. So when I write my partial sums, I'm going to write them this way. Sum. Oh, I should start at sum of zero. Shoot. All right, sum sub zero, because we have a zero term. We started our count at zero. Said, okay, it's just seven times one. And then S1, that's the sum of the zero term plus the one term. So that's seven times one 
plus a fourth. This is what I mean by factoring out the seven. Okay. Now, one plus a fourth, I'm going to use the decimals in this example, right? Because this example is going to be easier to see with the decimals than using some other clever tricks. If you haven't noticed yet, that's one of the big things about partial sums is being able to see your partial sums in the right way. Sometimes that's easier to do than others. If you know it's telescoping, you know not to use decimals. You say, oh, let's cross out some things. If, you know, like in the first one we did, we had two to the n in the denominator and two to the nth minus one in the numerator, it was perfectly fine to add everything up and get a single fraction. This one, I'm gonna use decimals. And like we usually do, what I tend to do on my calculator is I have one plus a fourth And I've already calculated that, so I just add a 16. And I get, in parentheses, 1.3125. Now I'm going to stop doing this in just a moment, writing out this way. But we add a 64th, and inside of the parentheses, I get 1.328125. Now, I'm not going to write this part, but the next step, I would add 1 over 256. And that would give me 1.33203125. And then I would add 1 over 1024. I end up with, in parentheses, 1.3330007813. And then I would add 1 over 4096. Seven times one point three three three. Two five one nine five three. And I'll do that one last one. Let's add one over sixteen three eighty four. What you end up with is seven times 1.3333, What's it look like we're getting closer to? In parentheses. 1.3 repeating. 1.3 repeating, isn't it? <clears throat> So I don't know a closed form for my S sub n, right? There's no real good pattern. But numerically, we see 
that the limit of s sub n of s sub n seems to be seven times one point three repeating. Now, I'm going to write that as a fraction four thirds. Okay, that makes sense. If you wanted to write 1.3 repeating, that's fine, but I'm going to write this fraction four thirds. That's the one I'm going to use. And therefore, even though I don't have a nice pattern that I can, you know, come up with, I can still see that numerically, this infinite series is converging to seven times four thirds. Now, as you probably noticed, we did a lot of partial sums. We put in a lot of work to get that result. Okay. Using partial sums with this geometric series, we could find the answer, but it took time. So this brings us to looking for some shortcuts to finding these infinite series. And the first shortcut that we're going to look at to find a sum is a shortcut that has to do with geometric series, okay? We already had one shortcut, right? One shortcut is that if the limit of the underlying sequence is not zero, then the infinite series is going to diverge. So that was a shortcut for finding divergence. With geometric series, we actually have a shortcut for convergence as well. All right? So here it is. If we have a geometric series, and a geometric series is always defined by an infinite sum of what we call A, that's just a constant out front, that was like the number seven in our example, times R to the nth power. And R could be any number, any base. If R is between negative one and one, so if the absolute value of R is less than one, then it turns out the infinite series is going to converge to A divided by one minus R. So long as the infinite series starts its count at N equals zero. Now, if the infinite series starts at count starts its count at n equals another number, it still converges, but just to a different number. And I'll see. I'll show you how to adjust if need be. Okay, n equals zero is the easiest. Um, the a over one minus r is sort of the quickest. calculation for this infinite series. So that's why we like starting geometric series 
at n equals zero. But if it doesn't start at n equals zero, we just adjust it. And again, I'll show you how to do that in a second. So if the base here, the R, has absolute value less than one, then it converges. And specifically to A over one minus R. If the base, meaning the R, has absolute value greater than one, then these numbers never go to zero, so it diverges, right? If R is one, then this is just a constant number added up over and over and over again, like 0. 0.4 plus 0. 0.4 plus 0. 0.4. If R is more than one, if R was like two, then these are getting bigger, right? So the sum of a bunch of numbers that are getting bigger is gonna go off to infinity. So that's the geometric series shortcut. Now, <laughs> we already calculated in our last example that the infinite sum here was seven times four thirds. I want to show you that in the context of the geometric series. So you don't have to write this down if you don't want, but I just want you to show what's happening. So geometric series is an infinite series. And again, we like to start to count at n equals zero. That looks like a times r to the n. So a in our case was seven, and the r was one fourth. Since R is a fourth, and a fourth is less than one, obviously, we know this is going to converge. Let me write this. The series converges. to a over one minus r. My a is seven, and I'm gonna divide by one minus a fourth. That is seven divided by three fourths. Dividing by three fourths is like multiplying by the reciprocal. Right? And so it's the same as multiplying by four thirds. Dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Notice how much faster this is than having to go find the partial sums and then calculate the decimals and then try to figure out the decimal version of it. Does that make sense? So this is a really, really nice shortcut for finding the convergence of a geometric series. Now this only works for geometric series. This only works when our series has the form A, times r to the n, summed up from one to infinity, or not, from zero to infinity. We can adjust the starting point, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. So here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to use the shortcut rule on this infinite series. I'm going to call this example 5a. We're going to start our series with n equals 0. And we're going to sum 
from n equals zero up to infinity, five times two ninths to the nth power. All right, so it goes really quick. Five times two ninths to the nth power is a geometric series. We are starting our counts at zero. My R here is the two ninths, which is less than one in absolute value. Um, by the way, I know I haven't dealt with a negative yet, but if R is negative two ninths, still works, okay? So that means the series is going to converge to A over one minus R. In our case, that is five over one minus two nines. Now, when you take one minus two ninths, you get seven ninths. In the denominator. So it converges to five times nine over seven. So this infinite series is five times nine over seven, or if you wanted to, you could write 45 over seven. By the way, if you did that with part, try to do that with partial sums, you could, but nine sevenths is not a nice decimal that's like easy to recognize mentally. You know, um, 1.333 repeating, you know, when you have lots of threes in a row, that's pretty easy to see mentally that, oh yeah, that's 0 0.3 repeating. It's getting close. But when the decimal nine sevenths, that's like 1.28571428571. you know. That's uh, a little bit harder to see, harder pattern to recognize. So this geometric series is really, really nice in this case. Now, the next, for the next step, we say, what if, I didn't want my sum to start at zero. What if I dealt with an infinite series that started at one or even some other number? Okay. Now we're gonna use the last problem, okay? That's the trick here. That's why this is called 5B. 
The other one is called Five A. So what if we started? So we want to find that if it's series. From the last problem, we found when you go an infinite sum from zero to infinity of five times two ninths to the n, you get 45 over seven. Also, let's just talk in general. When we're summing up from zero to infinity, that's like taking an a sub zero plus an a sub one plus an a sub two plus an a sub three plus so on and so forth. Notice that when you start at zero, if I lop off this first term, those next terms are a sum from n equals one to n equals infinity. So basically what I'm saying is this. So how does that work with what I know previously? Well, if I put those two things together, I know this infinite sum is 45 over seven. You don't have to write all these steps every time, but I'm trying to just, like always, put it more into your notes than what you really need, right? But so that you can't, so that you see where it's coming from. Okay. But this infinite sum from zero to infinity is the same as if I would have taken five times two ninths to the zero plus infinite sum from one to infinity. So I'm replacing the left-hand side with the zeroth term plus all the other terms. Be okay with that. This is getting replaced with this. Five times two ninths to the zeroth power is just five. So if I subtract five from both sides of this equation, I end up now being able to calculate 
45 over 7 minus 5. Just type that in your calculator and turn it into, that's 10 sevenths. And that's it. That's how I find it. Now, what would happen if we started our count at 3? N equals 3. Well, you just take 0, the 2, the 1, the 2 terms, lop them off, right? We're just dealing with the first three terms, lop those off. We're done. Does that make sense? So if you have to start your count at anything else, what you do first is you start with the n equals zero count. And then you say, well, how many terms is that that I need to kind of drop out? And then drop off however many terms you want. Any questions about that? Pretty, I don't know, that, that easy, not bad. All right. I want you to try this one on your own. Six <laughs> A. Let's just do this one. Find an infinite sum of 6 over 2 to the n. And our count starts at 2 and goes up to infinity. All right, let me give you the trick to this. This is a, uh, there's a slight trick, not too bad, but slight trick to this one, okay? And the trick is to rewrite this so it looks like a geometric series, okay? This one is a geometric series, but it's not written in the same way we had before. So notice that, the n only applies to the two in the denominator. So the six is just a constant number. So I'm gonna sort of factor that out. And then if a two in the denominator is being raised to the nth power, I can treat that as being like one half to the nth power. Okay. 
So this is how I think of it. Now, this is a geometric series which is with count starting at two. And I know that if my count were to have started at zero, since my r is equal to one half, which is less than one, it's going to converge. Yeah, let me write this, dang it. Let me write it here, geometric series. Since r is one half, the series converges. And more specifically, if I started my count at zero, this series would converge to A over one minus R. A being the coefficient out front, which is six. And R being, once again, one half. If I do that calculation, six divided by one minus a half, if I do it correctly, I get 12. Is that all right? By the way, that part right there, that was 6a. That was 6a. Here, following along on the guided notes. 6b says, well, I wanted to start my count at 2. So I know that if I start my count at 0 and go to infinity, 6 times 1 half to the nth power has to be 12. But I can lop off the zeroth term and then the first term. This is kind of mixing and matching my notation. Hopefully that's not too terrible. Is that okay? Kind of a mix and match notation here. So if you lop off your zeroth term, and your first term, then you can start your count at two. The zeroth term is six times one half to the zeroth power. The first term is six times one half to the first power. We know this sum on the left has to be equal to 12. This is 6, this is 3, so they add to 9. Subtract 9 from both sides. And you see your infinite series starting with n equals 2, going up to infinity, adding 6 times 1, one half to the nth power has to be 3. Is that all right? Again, I'm trying to provide as many steps as I can. I'm sure when you're doing this on your own, when you're doing this on a, a homework or for a test, you might be able to skip a step or 
you don't always have to write this line. The fact is geometric series. You don't always have to write that since R is equal to this converges. It's important to know, but in terms of you know, writing your work, you probably don't need to do that. So count when it starts at zero, gives me A over one minus R, as long as the absolute value of R is less than one. Now that brings me to something that people will often get thrown by. A lot of times we get so used to geometric series where the R is between negative one and one, or the absolute value of R is less than one, that when people come across a geometric series with an R of, for instance, 1.2, they automatically put it into that A over one minus R formula, okay? But this is a geometric series with R of 1.2. Since this R, an absolute value, is bigger than one, the infinite series diverges. So the sum, by the way, this would diverge to infinity as well. These numbers keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger that you're adding up. So that's not needed, but. So that infinite series diverges. So be really careful about that. Some people get into the habit of doing the A over one minus R so much that you know they just start putting in five over one minus 1 1.2 and then start calculating that. Now I wanna show you what happens in this case because it's kind of a funny thing. you get out a negative 25, right? If you put in A over one minus R. Now I wanna just tell you how kind of funny that is because we're adding up a bunch of positive numbers here and you're ending up with a negative 25. So that should send up red flags too. But it's better if you just notice that R is bigger than one, so the series diverges. But when you do things wrong, you get, get some funny answers, so. <clears throat> All right. So that was a shortcut rule for a geometric series, okay? Now we're going to look at some other types of series as well. So the geometric series shortcut rule is one of the nicest shortcut rules that there is. Because not only does it tell me whether it converges or diverges, when it does converge, it tells me exactly what it converges to, A over 1 minus R. The next few shortcut rules that we're gonna see are just going to tell me whether a certain series converges or diverges. 
So another type of series is called the P series. And P is a shorthand for power. So it's a power series. It's an infinite sum of one over N to a certain power, like one over N squared, one over N to the fourth power, one over N to the 0.5 power. Now this sum starts at one and goes to infinity, but it, technically it could start at any number and go to infinity. All right. The powers are always positive because if they were negative, we would have written n in the numerator instead of the denominator. So that's the P series. Okay. We're going to talk about the convergence of that in just a little bit. Okay. But I want you to recognize what a P series is. That's a big deal. We're going to get a shortcut rule for the P-series. And then we're going to expand that rule out to other series that are kind of like P-series. Okay. Before we do that, I want you to give, I want to give you some other shortcut rules too, though. All right? If we are... If I know that an infinite series converges to L, and then somebody says, well, let me just take a constant number and multiply it times that infinite series, then the constant number times L is going to be the new summation. Okay, so for instance, we figured out that this summed up to 45 over 7. If somebody said, actually, I want this 5 to change to a 15, that's just 3 times 5, we'd be able to say, well, the new sum then is 45 over 7 times 3 whatever that happens to be. And on this one, we figured out that the sum was one. If somebody said, well, let's multiply that times six. Well, then the new sum would be six. Right, one times six, six. By the way, it works on these as well. If somebody said, well, actually, let's multiply this by a constant of 14, guess what? It still diverges. Okay. So multiplying anything we've already calculated by a constant just takes that limit and multiplies it by the same constant, right? And again, when I say multiply by a constant, I'm saying multiply each term by a constant. The next thing is if we have a series that has a limit L and another series which has a limit K, so one series converges to L, another series converges to K. If you add up the terms in those series and then create a new term, a new series based on the sum, then we can just simply know that the sum of L and K is what the series is going to converge to. These should be fairly intuitive, right? Hopefully. Hopefully these are fairly intuitive. Let me give you an example of using this. 
if I said, let's take an infinite series, 1 over 2 to the n, plus 5 times 2 ninths to the nth power. So every term is going to look like that. I could simply say, well, that's going to be the same thing as taking 1 over 2 to the n in an infinite series and then adding 5 times 2 ninths to the nth power in another infinite series. And we actually already found out that this one was 1, this other one was 10 sevenths. So whatever that adds to, you get sum. Does that make sense? This works when each individual series has a limit. Okay. If you go back to the telescoping series, this trick doesn't work. Because it turns out that the sum of 1 over n is actually infinity. And also the sum of 1 over n plus 2 is infinity. So you get infinity minus infinity and weird things. Some, that could be anything you want, right? That's an indeterminate form. So this only works when each of these individually have So those are properties of infinite series that we can use. Now that we have rules to figure out geometric series and we've done some partial sums, that these broaden what we can find, okay? Now the last thing I wanted to mention. We're not going to go over all of these series and finding partial sums. Okay. But I do want to mention that if you used partial sums on certain really interesting series, they give you really interesting results. Again, these are not something you have to commit to memory or anything. But it turns out, if you sum up 1 over n factorial, you end up with the number e, summing it up from 0 to infinity. You end up with e. It's a very interesting result, right? You sum up all of these fractions that have denominators, which are whole numbers, and you end up with an irrational number. So an infinite sum of rational numbers gives you an irrational number, specifically one that we've seen before, e. Same thing happens over here. If you sum up 1 over n squared from 1 to infinity this time, you end up with something that has pi in it, technically pi squared over 6. That's a really, really weird result. If you're willing to not just have positive one on top, but alternate back and forth between a positive one and a negative one on top, then you get pi squared over 12. So your result gets cut in half if you alternate between positive and negative one on top. 
And then you can see some other ones like alternate between positive and negative one on top and your denominator is just the odd numbers. Two n plus one, you're gonna get one, three, five, seven in the denominator. And you end up with pi over four, weirdly enough. If you alternate back and forth between one and negative one on top and then divide by n, so that's a sum of like one over one, minus one over two, plus one over three, minus one over four, you end up with a natural log of two. So these are really, really strange results. Pi pops up in a place where you wouldn't expect it, you know, in those middle three. E pops up in a place you wouldn't expect it. A natural log pops up in a place you might not expect it. So those are just some interesting sums. And I'm not going to go through those. If I had an extra 10 minutes, I'd show you like one of those and try to get the partial sums. Probably this one. So I'd probably use the partial sums and see what that what happens here. But uh, those are just some interesting things that you can find out with partial sums. Now, next time, we're going to deal a lot with these P-series. Okay, so we define them this time, but next time we're going to focus a lot on these power series, P series. Okay, uh, don't forget homework's due tomorrow at five on those first two. We're done with this section, and then we'll start section eight three next time. Okay, is P series on the eight point two homework?